With traffic congestion choking many British cities, public transport seems the most obvious solution. Government policy has now turned this problem over to the free market. For the majority of the country, deregulation came into effect back in 1986. Only Greater London was excluded. With the governing influence set aside, Britain's largest bus market is open for new companies to operate on any route at any time, wherever a clear opportunity for profit is seen. The old London transport itself has been divided into separate ownerships, which will compete not only with the private sector, but also among themselves. Questions have arisen whether such rivalry is healthy not just for the long-term market, but for the consumer. Pollution is a well-known result of the motor car, it could be argued that buses simply add to this and cause added congestion. Congestion that the CBI says is costing British industry £12 million a year in loss of revenue. Ever increasing demands on our roads need foresight in transport policy. One double decker bus can carry on average 78 people, the average of 46 car journeys at 1 15th of the road space. London is only now come to terms with problems advanced by deregulation upon its transport system. As in some areas of the country, garages will close as more buses fight against individual car transport for following numbers of passengers. New and expanding bus companies will create a wide diversity of choice and force at first a healthy competitive market. But the dominance of the familiar red bus could in the long term mean that these immature businesses will be driven out of the capital centre into the lesser home counties. A transport authority could control this effect, but will need to take lessons from the observations of other such outlying bodies. The government's flagship in Chester has had to do little, with private companies organising themselves at no expense to the consumer. A poster this South Yorkshire plunged into and is still overwhelmed by a chaos. Unfortunately, problems were not realised in this case until well after 1986. Deregulation has caused a number of problems in South Yorkshire, partially because South Yorkshire started with a very historic background. South Yorkshire was the place where the old county council piloted cheap bus fares, and whatever anyone says about cheap bus fares and the amount of money it cost the ratepayers at that time, there was one thing that was certain. It worked as far as getting people onto the buses and off the roads. Now, South Yorkshire has experienced a great culture shock in going from an arena with plenty of buses running coordinated routes at cheap bus uh, fares to fewer buses in the rural areas, more buses on the profit-making routes, increased fares and buses adding to congestion rather than taking away from it. To give the example, Sheffield High Street had 170 buses an hour going through it before deregulation. After deregulation, it achieved a peak of 340 buses an hour, exactly double the number of buses, but yet the number of people using them was going down all the time. So South Yorkshire has had a very bad experience of deregulation. The fifth biggest city in England, Sheffield, unlike Chester, has had to face greater and more widespread problems since late 1985. The South Yorkshire Transport Executive, governed by the Transport Authority, provides tenders for essential non-profitable routes to operate. These include morning and Sunday services, as well as rural and school buses. Trains are contracted from British Rail to run the county's sprinter services. Sheffield City Council has implemented several traffic management schemes, creating in line with PT policy, bus-only routes and one-way systems. In doing so, many bus operators seem to be excluded, with passage through the city extremely restricted, resulting in dense congestion and grievance. A series 
to so-called bus boards as rock transport within the city. It looks to many that the council want to provide a hierarchy in transport, giving priority to a massive new super tram network. Buses next in line with private cars discouraged in favour of park and ride ideals. With relevance to Greater London, how much of this has been done because of deregulation and what is natural development? Deregulation has had effects on some of the sections of the community who can afford it least. Partially, you can't separate out deregulation from other measures, which is just a general lack of government funding. But one thing that is certain is that the coordination of the network has gone since deregulation. And it's not as easy for pensioners to know when buses are going to be coming. The buses tend to be older, they tend to have higher step heights, not easy to board. And because of the financial pressures that are on us, pensioners have seen the bus fare go from zero, that pensioners travelling within certain time periods used to be able to travel free, to now paying 25 pence to travel. And on a limited income, that can be a severe blow to mobility. As far as the disabled bus network is concerned, that has been of limited success since deregulation, but only because other agendas have changed and that the government's focus on care in the community has meant that there are more services specifically for disabled people. And I think it's made organisations such as the Transport Executive have their work cut out in publicising all operator information. Certainly in 86, when deregulation first happened, bus operators took a very narrow view of their markets. The market was only the people who used their buses. So what tended to happen was the larger operators would publish timetables and they would say that there wasn't a service on the Sunday. That was just because the service on the Sunday happened to be run by a different operator. That must be very confusing for people. We, because of that, at the Transport Executive, have had to build up a network of travel shops, of all operator information, and we currently spend over a million pounds a year in trying to make sure that people just know when the buses are running. But it does tend to be a battle that we'll never win, because with about 1,500 bus services across the county, we tend to see about 1,500 changes in the year. That means to say, on average, each service changes once. The reality is that some services are stable, but some services are changing even every few weeks, and passengers very often don't know if the times have changed, the fares have changed, or even the colour of the buses have changed. With the outlawing of cross-subsidy between profitable and loss-making routes, one consumer benefit has been lost but in the battle to win passengers, new ones have arisen. It's difficult to quantify the benefit to the consumers. There are a limited number of occurrences where new routes have been established that weren't there before, um, but it's difficult to think of a large number of them. So there hasn't been a great deal of innovation out there, but there has been some that's benefited the consumers. The major benefit of deregulation is the one that the government points to, and that's that, in general, deregulation has meant less subsidy from the public purse. That the ratepayers or local taxpayers as a whole aren't paying as much for their buses. Having said that, the alternative does seem to be one of, do you want a few pence on the rates per week, or do you want a few pence on your bus fares every day? And I'm not sure that the amount of money that's been saved out of the public purse hasn't just been completely enveloped, enveloped by the large increase in fares for people who actually use the buses. I think cross-subsidy still exists, but it exists in an internal marketplace rather than an external one. That bus operators, I'm sure, still run some services at a loss, perhaps in the evenings or on Sundays, so that they can make sure that they're still the only operator on the route. What used to happen, though, was that there was a much more blanket cross-subsidy than just an operator deciding to run a few services either out of goodwill or to make sure that no one saw a gap they could enter into the market. What used to happen is that um, a profit-making service would not go into a company's balance sheet 
it would go into the public purse to come out again on a loss-making service. Now, what deregulation has meant is that there's been a fragmentation of public service provision. It's not the great and good PTE with a large fleet of buses plus the National Bus Company anymore just doing their thing. It's operators with individual agendas and the scope for cross-subsidy is limited by the size of the operation you've got. If you've only got a small operation with 10 buses, it's going to be very difficult for you to cross-subsidise everything. Every bus is going to have to pay for itself. Technically still publicly owned, South Yorkshire Transport, now SYT Mainline, is being bought out by its own workforce. Seeing its public monopoly slip, can it still hold on to the majority of business in the free market? And what lessons have been learned from intense competition? Within the, the bus uh, market itself, um, our market share is only 65-70%. It's a big share, but there is a lot of competition. And um, to start with, yes, SYT did buy some of its competitors. Um, recently we haven't done so. Um, we've changed policy. Um, I think the purchase of smaller bus companies has always been part of the bus industry, so there was nothing new to do that. In fact, a lot of small bus companies um, grow up with, with a view to building the business up and then selling it on to the bigger operator. It's always been traditional in the industry, and it's actually encouraged competition because people have been able to come into the market with a view to eventually, if they make a success of it, selling it on to a big operator. And in fact, there are some small bus companies who are now very worried that the government, through the... Uh, the OFT and the Monopolies and Mergers Commission are actually preventing that from happening because it, it is now the case that we are prevented from being able to buy up smaller bus companies. We're still, we, we had the final uh, outcome of the House of Lords uh, decision which was that we, um, we should be required to sell the Sheaf Line and SUT subsidiaries but the decision on whether we have to sell them in actual fact rests with the Office of Fair Trading, and they now have to decide whether the fears they expressed some three years ago about what we would do if we took these companies over, whether those fears would actually have come about. They expressed fears, for instance, that we'd stick fares up, that we'd reduce frequencies, and the quality of service would fall because we'd taken over these services. Now, we've now argued that, in fact, the opposite has happened. I think all bus companies um, have had to operate in a highly competitive situation in the city centre and I think dereg the, the, the bad side of deregulation has resulted in literally buses trying to get to bus stops first um, and drivers perhaps going a little bit further than they should and I think that's applied to all bus companies because bus drivers now know that whoever they work for at the end of the day their wages are paid out of the passengers fares. So I think there has been some bad practices, but I think, qu quite frankly, uh, all operators have indulged in those, not just one. Um, and to me, that is the downside of deregulation. I f personally feel competition should not be on the streets competition. It should be competition for the right to run a quality service on certain roads. That's the situation which now uh, is, is, is in London. With subsidies having been reduced, we've we've actually had to reduce our mileage considerably because South Yorkshire was one of the most heavily subsidised areas of the country. The average fare was something like 7p in, in 1985 and it's now something like 50p. So obviously a lot of people have stopped using buses and therefore we've had to cut back our mileage accordingly. But I wouldn't say we've, um, we've taken buses out of any one area in particular. We have tended to concentrate on providing a very high frequency on the main roads. In fact that's where the name Mainline came from, that we're, no, we're now changing our image to mainline and that name came from the concept of making sure we provided a very high level of service down the main roads. The strongest challenge to SYT mainline was established in the late 80s by five ex-employees. Yorkshire Terrier, unlike Mainline, is still expanding and now has a fleet size of over 70 vehicles locked in head-on battle upon Sheffield's more profitable routes.
We've had a bus board ever since we started. It's been the situation that whenever we've gone on a particular route then we've had resources thrown at us from, shall we say, other operators mainly, SYT mainline, call, call them what you will. Uh, we've lived with that from day one and we're quite content that we can live with it in the future. It's, it's, we've never known anything else. We did have a three-year plan that uh, initially took us through to 50 vehicles, uh, which in actual fact were more or less kept with. Uh, the longer term aim is to build the company up more and more until we reach the optimum size that we, when we feel the time is right, not to expand anymore, but we've not come to that stage yet, so we might never come to that stage. In the early days, after one or two of the smaller companies set up, uh, I think SYT, the director of SYT, took the view that uh, the best way to deal with competition would have been to eliminate it by taking it over. And they did this with Sheaf Line, uh, Don Valley, uh, one or two small independents out Doncaster Way. Um, Groves in Sheffield. Uh, they never tried it with us because I think there was too much animosity between ourselves and the the, the board of SYT. Uh, I think they would have received very little encouragement from us if they had to come along to us. But uh, as time's gone on now, I think they realised that if they were to take over some of the smaller ones, then there are other ones replacing them just as quick, so really it's a waste of the money. In the short term, head-on competition is wonderful for the passengers in that you get buses flooding routes. In the long term, that cannot continue to happen because it becomes uneconomic, so therefore it finds its own level. I suspect, in the long term, there has got to be some sort of coming together, whether it's through government legislation, whether it's through local authority, or whether it's through uh, independence agreeing. But I, I think, in the long term, and I don't know how long that is, it will happen. In the short term, there's been no end of companies sprung up to start doing commercial service in the main and we have got a nice little niche. Uh, we've got a very loyal fo uh, following of passengers. Uh, again, in the longer term, I suspect that, as I said before, it, it will find its own level. I think that the smaller companies will perhaps uh, either fall by the wayside or join together. One such small company is Aston Express. It operates three services out of the city and depends on the lucrative private hire market for the balance of its trade. Re-established in 1992, it is one of the latest additions to bus companies in Sheffield and also relies on its survival with valuable ex-SYT experience. A small company like Aston Express running small service vehicles uh, can run around small hamlets and villages in the uh, rural areas which large operators don't, are uh, not interested in. They would totally miss them out, but uh, we ourselves can provide, provide a living by running around the small villages and etc. And there'll always be a place for that. One way that we compete uh, is to provide a friendly service. Uh, recently a large operator has registered a bus service five minutes in front of us and charging approximately 25% of our own fare. So they've undercut us quite considerably. We're still carrying passengers simply because we provide a friendly service and more or less drop people out the doors on, on quite a few sections of the route. So people are sticking with us. 
because they don't remember the larger companies in the past. They've uh, ignored them in the past, they have, and just uh, knocked the services off and they're not carrying enough passengers. But running small vehicles, we can afford to carry less passengers than the large companies can. Regarding uh, since deregulation free choice for passengers on, on the different companies, I think it's been quite a good thing in a lot of areas, but some areas have lost out. But in general, I think it's been quite a good thing. Uh, one or two companies are now starting to cut prices on the bus fares. And I, th I think the only pas people to lose on that in the end are the passengers. In the short term, it's, it's nice for the passengers to get lower fares, but in the long term, it means that somebody will fall by the wayside and therefore the passengers will then start losing the amount of the choice that they have got. We ourselves not, do not intend getting into a price war. We set our fares at a realistic level and that's what we will stay at. Quite a few companies have started very small since deregulation and they've got many buses very quickly. I think quite a few ideas have been to for the company to get very large quickly and then sell out to one of the bigger operators. Quite a few in, in and around the Sheffield area have done that in the past. Our aim is we have at the moment six vehicles and we do not really intend getting much larger. That's that's where we wish to stay with half a dozen vehicles providing an efficient and friendly service. With falling profit margins, cutbacks are inevitable as a direct result of free choice. A new era in road transport has had and will continue to have for the foreseeable future negative drawbacks. Built in a constructive frame of mind, the city's new super tram system offers with phase one 22 kilometres of fast reliable passage, eventually joined by seven more sections. Powered by electricity, the actual 21st century trams are 35 metres in length and are designed more like trains than buses, similar in character to those in Manchester. Time at stop should be no more than 20 seconds. Given automated priority through junctions and some segregated lengths of track, the tram is planned to be faster and easier for the user. In keeping with transport in Sheffield, the Super Tram has had an uphill battle. First blocked by the City Council, public opposition has meant the truncation of some lines. The company has hit back with an extensive public relations campaign reported to be visited by over 1,800 people a day. But as the tram is a fixed rail system, it will depend on the cooperation of bus companies to provide feeder buses. Some residential areas that are directly serviced continue to mount pressure groups in order to change plans for both stops and routes. Yes, the origins of Supertram come from a major land use transportation study in mid-1970s, as well as the normal things that come out of these studies like major road schemes, many of which are still being built. The idea of a mass rapid transit system which could take people along various corridors into the city centre actually came up as, as a very positive idea of meeting future congestion. Now, later on in the 80s, in fact, you went into a period where there was South Yorkshire County Council and its cheap bus fares policy. It was very easy to travel around the county by bus at very low fares. Uh, there was a high ridership within the, within the county, whereas within the rest of the country, in fact, ridership was declining. Now, this was seen, unfortunately, as not being possible to keep going for very long periods. The government weren't too keen about this policy. And as we approached the middle 1980s, it was obvious the South Yorkshire County Council was going to be abolished and their powers would be passed to the district councils. And therefore, in the early 1980s, the project Supertram was taken fairly seriously. A number of preliminary studies were done on the engineering side, the environmental side, the patronage, obviously, because if he didn't make a profit, he wouldn't stand up. And these were taken through to quite a, a great extent in the fact that in 1985, a bill was prepared to put into Parliament. And this bill, in fact, was initially opposed by the City Council. But having said that, further studies were undertaken. And in 1986, the City Council decided that it would withdraw its objection. Um, and though it went through various stages and there was a fair amount of opposition, in 1988, we finally got the Bill of Parliament, which gives us powers to build the system.
basically, obviously, a lot of the patronage of Supertram will derive from bus services. Something like, initially, uh, 70 to 80 percent of people who will ride on Supertram will have before been using either buses or, for instance, to Meadow Hall British Rail services. 30 percent we hope to get out of their cars and get them to transfer onto Supertram. It's difficult to say the effects that it will actually have on the bus services as they exist at the moment. Because it's a very competitive world, the bus operators will keep their powder dry and make their decisions at the final, final time that we actually open. If I could give a, a personal view, I think what will happen is that it is unlikely that the bus companies as such will see us or try and see us off directly in terms of competing at lower fares on the same routes. What they will do is look at other destinations, maybe using part of the route where they can interchange with us, but then going to another destination. They obviously also have the ability of going round estates and picking up off of local roads, which we don't have with a fixed rail system, um, before going into town as well. There are a number of options open to them. What we would hope is that we actually have as much coordination as possible. Another thing we would like to see in the longer term is through ticketing, whereby using one ticket you can use buses, light rail, or heavy rail. I think that unfortunately is a thing for the future. Uh, legislation makes it quite difficult at the moment. The way that the super tram company will, will operate has been laid down by the government. Basically, although the assets, the trams and the tramway will stay within public ownership, um, this is really with South Yorkshire PTE, the operation of the system uh, under South Yorkshire Supertram Limited uh, will actually go into the private sector. Now, South Yorkshire Supertram Limited at the moment is a wholly owned subsidiary of South Yorkshire PTE. After about a year's operation, the, the government proposed to privatise the company. What they're actually after is getting some of their money back from the money they've actually put into the project. And if you actually look at the prof profitability of our franchise over 30 years, you can actually have a capital sum up front, which is the value of the company, and that is what they're trying to raise. We obviously will then be competing directly with the other private companies, the other bus companies, that are running public transport in Sheffield. What we would hope to do is that we would have a coordination between them so that we actually provide a much wider quality of choice to people who can use local British Rail services, they can use super tram services, or they can use the local bus services and therefore that it's an extension of uh, basically choice for people in Sheffield um, rather than becoming any form of monopoly. I just don't see that situation actually coming about, certainly with the present leg legislation. And I've never seen so many buses in my life. How do you do? Never seen as many buses as this. With focus switched to economic gain, the passengers' opinions and needs could easily be lost. In Sheffield, a small group of passengers have formed an association to represent people without whom the industry would have no use. Although lacking in any statutory powers, the cooperative is listened to by most bodies and has had some effect. Well, the Sheffield Passengers Association is an association of people and organisations that speak for and act on behalf of the passenger in any way that affects uh, public transport. I wouldn't say that in Sheffield routes have been hit particularly. Even the rural routes are nearly always as most uh, the same frequency as they were before. But sometimes uh, the odd bus is gone. But this is because under the regulations, if the council, or in our case the passenger transport executive, are not willing to subsidise it, then the service can go. On the other hand, many of the services that were tremendously subsidised before are now run as commercial services and don't cost the, uh, uh, anything to the public purse. We are a great believer in what we call prepaid tickets or multiple journey tickets because that enables the customer to uh, get on and off public transport when he wants to and experience all over the country and in other countries shows it actually increases the number of people using public transport, which is a good thing. But in South Yorkshire, for political reasons, the old passenger transport executive sold the saver card to South Yorkshire Transport, which gave them uh, a monopoly of that particular thing. And it took a lot of agitating by ourselves 
for three or four years before we had a ticket which is available on all the bus companies called Travel Master. Well, the, it started with a thing called a TRC, a Traffic Regulation Condition. We opposed this through the traffic courts and with appeals uh, because we said it did nothing to sort out the traffic congestion and it did uh, cause a lot of inconvenience to operators and to passengers. Now, in fact, how right we were proved because uh, three weeks after it was brought in, they had a traffic management scheme which totally altered the traffic in Sheffield overnight and got rid of the queues of buses, etc. You see, the buses were queuing because they couldn't get out at the end of the High Street or Church Street. It wasn't a bus's fault, it was the council's fault for not allowing them to do it. And we had suggested four years earlier various things which would stop all that. They wouldn't take any notice because they said super trams coming and we're going to alter the roads then in any case. Well, the traffic management scheme phase one and two were very good uh, and cleared most of the congestion. They've recently introduced phase three, which has recreated it in different places. So it's caused a lot of difficulty, but even now, with a little bit of common sense, it could be alleviated. In, in the future, um, buses have got a bigger role to play or a lesser role. Our, our car's going to be banned from the city centres. Right. Buses take over. Uh, so you could say, if buses can't take over with the free market, is the city council going to make sure they take over by banning cars? History can only tell whether such an expensive lesson and fractured market can be avoided in London. With the imminent arrival of Supertram, what does the future hold for transport in Sheffield? Thank you.